just email me at connie at waterlooarts.org and I will make sure that you get added to the list. Okay, without further ado, Elizabeth, take it away. Great, thank you guys so much for having me. Thanks, Connie, uh, for the introduction. It's always dangerous when you send those bios, then they start reading the whole thing. <laughs> You're like, oh Lord, <laughs> that's me. Um, hopefully everyone can see my screen here. And I really appreciate you guys making the time to come here about stormwater and sustainability and soils. I'm Elizabeth Heiser. I work for the Cuyahoga Soil and Water Conservation District. And uh, this is me with my rain garden. We're gonna talk briefly about rain gardens tonight. I'm excited to hear that you guys are gonna get a green roof and some other green practices. And we're gonna talk about those as well. I'm obviously an enthusiast of our green infrastructure. I work for Cuyahoga Soil and Water Conservation District. Our agency began in 1949 and was the first county agency in Cuyahoga to really focus on conservation and natural resource protection. We have education staff who work with local communities to implement educational programs like this one. We have watershed staff that support our communities and landowners to help address erosion and flooding issues in our urban watersheds. And we have technical stormwater staff who inspect construction sites to make sure that development impacts to our local water and soils uh, soil resources are minimized. If you follow our social media, you're probably most familiar with Amy Roskilly's really funny memes, like the one on the left. She's very, very savvy to all the pop culture stuff. Um, and another popular, or if you're like me, before I came to Soil and Water Conservation District, I knew us as those rain barrel workshop people. Um, so that's kind of our gateway drug to stormwater for everyone, <laughs> get, you, get you on board with, with doing good things for water and soil. Another popular involvement event that we do that highlights the impacts that we have on our local environment is our stream cleanups. And if you are anti-litter as much as I am, I would encourage you to consider joining our first virtual cleanup of the year which you can find about on our website. And it's for Valentine's Day week, so we can all fall back in love with uh, Lake Erie. So while Cuyahoga Soil and Water Conservation District, we're primarily focused on providing resources to protect and restore healthy water and soil resources, we have a wide variety of partners in the Cleveland area that are dedicated to the many different uh, legs of sustainability. And you can learn more about reducing your waste stream with Cuyahoga Solid Waste District, not to be confused with us. Um, they're missing the C. So we often get stuff to our website from them and vice versa. So those, you, those guys you probably know as the Cuyahoga Recycles people. Um, and they also do a lot on compost. And the other partner I wanted to make sure to highlight was Sustainable Cleveland out of the Cleveland Office of Sustainability. They have several working groups with focus areas that include waste, green spaces, neighborhood vitality, energy efficiency, as well as clean water. At the Soil and Water Conservation District, we participate in several of those working groups, including the Plastic Reduction Working Group, their Tree Canopy Revitalization Program, as well as we support their rain barrel program when they run out of free rain barrels. If you're in Cleveland and you live in Cleveland, make sure you check them out first to get free rain barrels. And then if they run out, we've got fancy ones for $60. <laughs> Um, I wanted to briefly highlight that they have a new program that I think ties in very well to what you guys are aiming to do in Waterloo, and it's their Circular Cleveland program. It pairs a lot of our regional conservation partners with business partners, and it's aimed at changing the current way we look at our model of consumption in Cleveland. You know, our current economy is really built on this take, make waste. We eat up resources, we use them to make products that we then just discard and they end up in landfills. And the Cle City of Cleveland Sustainability Office is working with Cleveland Neighborhood Pro Progress. They just received a grant to really analyze this, check it out in depth, research it, and work with local partners to create a more circular economy where we're getting rid of waste and pollution, get that out of the system completely and regenerate those ecosystem services while still supporting our economy. I'm gonna to talk to you tonight about stormwater and those solutions that we can use to address the issues that come from urbanized land uses. And then we're gonna take a deeper dive into soils, healthy soils and how you can support 
your fun gardens that you're going to uh, make beautiful in Waterloo. I try to avoid using jargony type words and watershed is perhaps one of those things. I'm a watershed program manager, but what the heck does that mean? Uh, it does not mean a shed that lives on the water, <laughs> spoiler. Uh, a watershed is simply a common area of land that all drains to the same place. And so in Ohio, we basically live in two main watersheds. If you're in Southern Ohio, you're in this red area of the state that drains south downhill towards the Ohio River. And if you're in Northern Ohio, like us, we're in this yellow area and everything drains north and downhill to the Lake Erie. So we all live in the Lake Erie watershed. This is a deeper dive into those watersheds in Cuyahoga County. Everything here is a different color for which streams are directly connecting us to Lake Erie. For example, I live in Westlake, which is this pink number 13 on the left. So I live in the Cahoon Creek watershed and water flows from North Olmstead into Westlake and into Bay Village and out to Lake Erie. Uh, whereas you guys in Waterloo, you're in one of these funny watersheds that has multiple streams in it. So you're in the Dugway Nine Mile Green Creek watershed and all of your water drains to one of those creeks and then ultimately out to Lake Erie. And we can think about the water cycle as having two paths basically where, where humans get involved. It's either coming from our houses, so inside the houses, it's when we flush our toilets, it's when we wash things down the drain. All of that is going to what we call a sanitary sewer. So that's this orange pipe on the left. Whereas everything we do outside of the house is going to our storm drain. That's our storm sewer system. Anything, whenever it rains or snows, that's heading to the storm sewer. And we call that stormwater runoff. So when it rains or it snows, the water travels downhills and it picks up everything in its path. So it's not just the rain that's ending up in those drains that feed to Lake Erie. It's also everything that that rain comes in contact with. Uh, and that's why we say Lake Erie starts here. <laughs> um, and we have these stenciled around our storm drains around the communities. We want your storm drain to look like the one on the right. We don't mean, when we say Lake Erie starts here, we don't mean that it biologically starts at your drain, but all of that stuff on the left, if not picked up, will go down the drain and it will end up in our creeks and in Lake Erie and it won't be treated. This is an exaggeration of what happens when we fertilize our lawn, but it is true that when we use fertilizers on our farms or in our gardens, all of that stuff filters into the groundwater or runs over the land and flows downhill towards Lake Erie. And why does the heck does that matter? Well, when we have events like the 2011 Lake Erie algae bloom, that's connected to those activities that we do on the land. That's connected to excess phosphorus, which is a nutrient that we'll talk about, which is important, but we don't want too much of it because this is what happens when we have too much phosphorus in Lake Erie. When we overuse fertilizers, we create these algae blooms. It costs us millions of dollars in recreation. Nobody wants to go fish or swim or recreate on a green lake. Uh, we want a nice blue lake because <laughs> we want to be able to swim um, and we want to have healthy drinking water. We get all of our drinking water from Lake Erie here and we have these intakes uh, that bring in that water from Lake Erie and take it back to our pipes. And we have to treat all of that to make sure that it's okay for us to drink. And that it's expensive to do that. Uh, so we really wanna make sure whatever we're sending on the land to Lake Erie that we're minimizing the amount of bad stuff that we don't want in our drinking water. Because we don't have to pay for, why not have to pay for treating all that stuff? It can be a major problem. Obviously in 2014, Toledo had to actually shut down their water plant because of that algae bloom. There was so much toxic microcystin that they couldn't even drink the water. It created a huge panic. Um, and it was a major problem. I wanted to highlight two more other disasters that really connect, um, make that connection between what we do on the land and how it impacts our soil and healthy water resources. And the first is the Dust Bowl. This was back in the 1930s. It was the perfect storm um, of environmental issues combined with human mismanagement of our farmlands. There was a huge drought uh, and these big, huge windstorms, and because they had been over planting the land, and then we had a depression, we now had all this topsoil that instead of having long rooted native 
plants in it, it had, um, it was devoid of anything holding to hold, hold the soil in place. And so when this high winds came and we had this drought, it literally carried all of the topsoil away. Uh, it created these huge storms. They, they traveled all the way from Central America out to the East Coast. Huge economic disaster, um, which, environmental disaster, which became an, an economic disaster. Out of this, the federal government created what we call the Natural Resource Conservation Service to help landowners do practices that will keep their soil healthy and keep it in place. Um, as we know, sometimes at the federal level, it's hard to connect to our local partners and actually get things done. And that's how soil and water conservation districts were made. So out of this disaster, I have a job now, um, <laughs> which is great. Uh, and we're here to help landowners do good things to keep their healthy soil. In the 1940s through the 70s, we used to just let you put whatever, uh, industry could discharge whatever they wanted into our rivers. And uh, there was no regulation on that. And what that meant was that our rivers looked like that picture on the bottom right. These are from the Cuyahoga River uh, in 1952. And what you normally see publicized is our 1969 fire. Uh, that was because Chepquiddick and all that was happening at the same time. So even though rivers were burning everywhere else, not just here in Cleveland, we became kind of infamous for this burning river because of the timing of when the report was released. Uh, they actually, the pictures they used in there were actually from the 1952 fire, which was a much bigger fire than 1969. But, you know, we're Clevelanders, so we know how to make the most out of lemons. So now we have Burning River Pale Ale. <laughs> um, we make the most of our challenges. I love this advertisement from the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, you know, kind of making light of ourselves, but it really did take a lot of hard work to fix this and make, make change. Um, and it requires a lot of great local partners. So out of that fire came, but with that and with a lot of environmentalists who were already trying to lead the charge to address these pollution issues came the Clean Water Act in 1972. And what they decided was, hey industry, we're gonna start limiting what you can send out of a pipe into our waters. So when we say point source, it's something coming straight from a pipe. And then they studied it and they were like, hey, we, we you know, addressed this, we took care of all these industrial pipes. And then they found out, oops, we're still not meeting our goals. Our waters still aren't as healthy as we would like them to be. And they recognized that this was because what we call non-point source pollution AKA stormwater. And the way they regulate that, it's a lot harder than regulating what comes out of a pipe. You can't just say, hey, so-and-so, stop putting X in the water. Um, so what they do is they tell communities, we want you to have a program to address stormwater issues. All of the, almost all of the communities in Cuyahoga County have a permit from the state that says, we're gonna educate our residents, we're gonna get them involved, we're gonna take care of pipes that are discharging illegally. We're gonna make sure that construction sites do the right thing and that we put practices like those green roofs or bioretention in place to address stormwater issues long-term and that our cities are gonna have good operations on their sites. So that's a lot of jargon and a lot of text, basically to say that we need to make sure residents are aware of these issues and that cities are, are addressing them. It's just water, so why the heck is this, you know, what's the problem? Well, every time it rains or snows, it's not just picking up, um, that's my dog there picking, picking up poop. Um, it's not just my dog that's pooping in Cuyahoga County. There's thousands of dogs, actually hundreds of thousands of dogs in Cuyahoga County pooping. There's not just one leaky car uh, with oil leaking, there's multiple cars. And when all of these practices cumulatively add up, they, they do create significant pollution. One jarring example of that is the Puget Sound watersheds. There's a frontline special called Poisons, Poisoned Waters. It's a documentary on PBS you can watch where they studied the amount of leaky car oil going into Puget Sound. And for every two years, just from leaky cars, cars that need repair, that's the same amount of oil that happened during that 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spill. So every two years, the Puget Sound's receiving that amount of oil that created a significant disaster. So, you know, everything we do adds up. So each little bit that we can all help to address these issues is really important. 
The other piece, that's the pollution piece. The other piece is just the sheer amount of water. Uh, in urbanized and suburbanized environments, that means we have a lot more parking lots, we have a lot more driveways, we have a lot more sidewalks, and all of these surfaces change the way water interacts with, with, a, with our soil and with, our, with nature. It's not soaked up as easily, so we have more flooding problems, basement backups, um, as well as erosion. And it's not just a problem for us as residents and as business owners, but also a problem for our wildlife. The more impervious surface or pavement that you get, the more problems we see with aquatic life. So less fish, less macroinvertebrates. And they found that around 18% is where you start to see real problems. And even back in 1994, you can see all of our local watersheds in the Cuyahoga area are well over that threshold. So we've got some things to address, but hey, We've got a beautiful lake and a beautiful city. It wasn't too long ago that you wouldn't have found people recreating on our beaches, but now they are. Um, we're doing great things, we're getting there, but we still have a, lot, a long way to go uh, to keep Cleveland green on our Blue Lake. Many of the practices we will talk about today were originally driven by these reaction to environmental disasters, like with the Dust Bowl, the river fires, or Toledo algae blooms. A lot of our behavior is very reactive. We, we have a problem, and then we try to take action to fix it. Tonight, I want to talk to you about sustainable solutions and thinking proactively rather than reactively. We want to think about the economic, the social, and the environmental viab viability of our practices and how we can make sustainable progress. So what can we do? How do we get our urban environment to act like forests and wetlands that used to be here? How do we get, uh, get water soaked in and get the pollution filtered out? Well, my suggestion is green infrastructure. <laughs> and so this is a really cool, cool green infrastructure installation. These are the twin towers uh, of the Bosco Verticale. And this is in Milan, Italy. These are these apartment towers that are just forests, basically, um, and we'd love to see more of that. See more of repurposing spaces that maybe don't need to be exclusively pavement. So this is an example of a street where the parking lanes have been minimized on the asphalt. So now instead of having the whole lane be pavement, you have the middle of it uh, actually soaking water into the ground. And then green roofs, which I just found out that you guys are applying for. <laughs> green roofs are a great way to repurpose a space that's really not doing a lot for the environment right now and can be repurposed to use to soak in water and to provide habitat in our alter urban environments. When we say green infrastructure, we basically mean water management with the goal of mimicking nature. Um, so the goal of protecting or restoring or recreating that natural water cycle. But we don't just want it to be, you know, mimicking. We want it to provide environmental benefits, social benefits, and economic benefits as well. And we want it to last. They need to be resilient. So there's a laundry list of different kind of green infrastructure practices. One of those is planter boxes, which we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about tonight, since that's your guys' big project. Uh, but we also have rain gardens and bioretention. The picture on the upper right is from Merwin's Wharf. If you're ever down there, you can check out their bio, they call them bioswales. If you're a bioswale or bioretention, those are just engineered rain gardens, basically. Um, green parking, Waterloo, you guys have some permeable pavement in your public parking areas, as well as an infiltration, a cool art, artsy infiltration basin. Uh, I used to inspect those before I was in this posi position and they were always looking really good. Um, and then some other, other green infrastructure practices. <laughs> Like I said, the gateway practice usually is rain barrels. Uh, Linda Zoltan Woods, I saw, was on here tonight. We worked with her uh, with the Cuyahoga Arts Council grant with Friends of Euclid Creek, and we did painted rain barrels. So you guys are obviously much better at making these beautiful as artists in your community. Um, but this is kind of the, the first step is storing water and repurposing it, reusing it to irrigate our lawns, not wasting that water. If it's causing a flooding problem, let's use it instead of, instead of contributing to the problem. Most green infrastructure either does like the rain garden, it captures that storm water and stores it temporarily. 
And then when you take it that next step further, it's that filtering and making that reconnection with, with the groundwater. And that's what a rain garden does. So a rain garden is gonna capture the rain from the sky, but then it's also gonna capture the rain from your building or your parking lot. And so it's really doing double duty. It's catching not just that runoff, um, but it's also catching something from another surface and it's filtering pollution, it's soaking it into the ground. It's beautiful because you get to plant it with the plants that you like. And there's a wide variety that will like it. It brings habitat for pollinators and it also eats pollution. So it's really amazing what, you know, just the addition of a rain barrel and a rain garden we can do to make it, to really make a significant impact. Planter boxes are a perfect example of how streets and alleys are an opportunity to add green infrastructure. These spaces, you know, that we interact with, but perhaps aren't always in use. So considering the addition of permeable pavement or planter boxes or adding these bioswales, the picture on the upper right is from Tremont. And not only were these rain gardens kind of serving as gardens and filtering stormwater from the street, but they're also used to calm traffic. Uh, so that's another way that you can integrate um, these stormwater practices into your neighborhood if you need to slow people down a little bit. We got a lot of people walking here. Um, slow down and check out our gardens. <laughs> On the bottom right, that's Fleet Street. They have a huge series of bioretention there as well as a large infiltration practice. So this is going on in our communities and I'm excited that you guys wanna even up, up the ante with your planter boxes. Because as gardeners, as business owners, as, neighbor, as neighborhood people, as a community, we really have the power to create a healthy landscape with high functioning ecosystems. We can design into our gardens the filtration of pollutants. We can decide to supply food for pollinators. We can decide we want this to slow down floodwaters and save energy. And I'm gonna talk about a few of these gardening solutions that maybe you guys can consider. Uh, examples here in the upper left would be a ring garden and the upper right would be converting some turf into a, a native landscape. Um, bottom left is our pollinator garden and bottom right is compost, which I'll talk about a little bit, leave, leave to our partners who know better uh, later in your programs to help with that. My first plug will be when you're, when you're considering how to make these gardens beautiful, check out some native plants. We have lists and links to native plants on our website. Native plants grew up here in Cleveland. They're tough, man. These plants know how to, how to work in our environment. So they're gonna require less input from you. They're gonna re provide more services and you aren't gonna have to do as much to maintain them. Um, there's a wide variety of native plants that would work well in, in our gardens here on the street. I would also plug that as you choose those plants, maybe think about pollinators. Pollinators are responsible for pollinating, pollinating nearly everything we eat. One out of every three bites, something had to pollinate that for us to eat it. So we're seeing a huge insect, um, you know, they're, they're dying out. So we need to provide services for them and creating these kind of pollinator uh, pockets along a street is huge uh, for a bee or a butterfly. And thinking about what plants do these pollinators that I want to bring to my garden need? For example, monarchs, I think, are the most common example where, where you, if you want a certain butterfly, they have to have certain plants because butterflies will only lay their eggs on milkweed. And a lot of our pollinators are like that. They grew up with a certain plant and they need that certain plant in order to come to your garden. If that piques your interest, Bringing Nature Home from Douglas Tallamy is a wonderful book that talks about why native plants will, will supply for our birds and our pollinators. And they have, they have partnered with the National Wildlife Federation to create this awesome native plant finder tool. And Connie, I think I forgot to send you this link, so I'll send this to you. But you go there, you put in your zip code, and you choose what butterfly you want, and it'll tell you the best plants to plant to bring that butterfly to your yard. Um, so it's really cool. I, I, I was like, all right, now I know. <laughs> because our pollinators, uh, this is not attractive to them. <laughs> I want you to think like a bee when you're creating these gardens and how can you add variety into the landscape to not only help the bees and other pollinators, but also to soak up all that extra runoff that we're experiencing in our urbanized landscapes. 
um, we really can address some of these big problems in our gardens. Because this is what the bees need. <laughs> they need. They need more variety. They need more native plants. You know, the more trees and shrubs and long-rooted plants that we can put in our landscape, we're going to help provide those services that we need to bring uh, bring nature to visit us. We want to make sure that not only are we friendly to the pollinators and we're addressing stormwater, we want these spaces to be friendly for anyone who can be using them. We want them to be environmentally friendly. We want them to be wallet friendly. We want kids and pets to be able to interact with our gardens. So we don't want to use chemicals that aren't safe for them. Uh, we want to bring wildlife. We want to protect our watersheds and we want it, you know, to create community and build a, a friendly neighborhood. And gardens really can do all of these things. So it's exciting. But there are some considerations. Uh, maintenance. I like to say during our rain garden class that a rain, building a rain garden is like, it's not like purchasing a chair. It's like purchasing a puppy. You got to take care of it. <laughs> you can't, you know, you got, it's everything requires maintenance. So there's going to be some weeding. There's going to be plants that just don't end up liking it and you got to replace them. So definitely considering that. Who's going to weed? Who's going to water? Um, making sure you have a plan in place. Uh, we're in an urbanized environment, so you need to think about what you're planting. If you're planting a tree around a sidewalk, you got to make sure that that's not a tree whose roots are going to disturb the sidewalk. You want to think about the view, uh, sight lines, making sure that it's a safe space. You don't want to plant big bushy shrubs in the middle of a parking lot that someone might be in at, at night. Um, you also don't want to block businesses. If, we're, if these are in front of businesses, we want to make sure we're not planting some tall grass and now I can't see the storefront. <laughs> Uh, and then we want to consider salt, which I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about. You guys are planting along a street, and in Cleveland, that means in the winter, salt is getting applied. Spoiler alert, plants in general don't really like salt. So applying salt is not, not good for plants. It's not good for our waters. Uh, we're actually finding that excess salt is not completely diluting out of the freshwater system. So studies by Ohio EPA are showing that our freshwater salt is rising slowly each year. So any salt we can minimize is good, um, and especially around our gardens. Never, never, never apply salt to your garden. If you need to apply it to your sidewalks, you want to make sure that you're doing it in the right amount. We have a pledge online that you can learn more about this, but basic take home, one mug of salt it's good enough for 10 sidewalk squares. The salt does not need to be caked in that huge pile like you saw in the previous photo. And if you take our pledge that you will apply salt appropriately, you can get a Lake Erie mug like this. <laughs> so with salt, I am not a container or garden expert. I know enough to be dangerous, but there are resources out there. We do have a weekly blog and Kelly Parker in our office has been experimenting with native plants and container gardens which I think would really be good for you guys to check out since your, your gardens are essentially container gardens. You're not planting in a large garden where you've got access to all the soil in the world. You're gonna be limited to whatever soil is in, in your contained gardens. So figuring out which plants are happy in those conditions is important. But we did find, Jacob in our office did find four that we thought with relative confidence, these are gonna be happy in containers and these are going to be relatively happy with salt. And they all happen to be native plants and they all happen to be beautiful. Uh, the upper right hand side is butterfly milkweed. This one, if you want to have um, monarchs come to your garden, this is a good one for that. They like it dry, so don't overwater those guys. And the lower left is blanket flower. I think that's one that people are familiar with. They see it. We try to find these native plants that aren't so crazy looking that people don't want them. So we want the beautiful ones or you want to maintain them so they look nice. Uh, lower right is American bellflower, very pretty um, stalks. And Eastern red columbine on the upper left is a really nice one. It doesn't bloom for very long, but um, hummingbirds do like that one. So, but where do we get those, Elizabeth? Native plants are hard to find. You can't just go, you know, to your, your big box store. Well, we've got them. Uh, Amy in our office put together this flyer. Uh, we've got a lot of native plant sales going on this spring and they go through about March if you want to do spring planting. And then on our website, we also have links to native nurseries that are local where you can get native plants as well as places where you can mail order. You can get seeds, you can get plugs. If you have a green thumb, go for the seeds, man. They're cheap 
If you're like me and you need to pay someone to grow your plants to a certain <laughs> size so that they will survive, uh, plugs are good. And if you have all the money in the world, there's some great nurseries out in Lake County that are doing uh, native, native plants and they've got good sized stuff if you want. You're like, I want my bang for my buck right now. That's where you wanna go. All this focus on what we wanna see, you know, above the ground. We wanna see all this beautiful stuff and create these beautiful spaces. Uh, we tend to focus on what we see and keeping up with the Joneses, making sure our space, space meets the community standards. And we have to forget about what's supporting those systems underneath. And that's our soil. So we're gonna take a deeper dive into our soils, get out our microscopes and take a look at what's going on under the ground. So the soil on the left, that's the good, that's what we want. Soil on the right might be what we have. Uh, so how do we get that healthy soil? If you're the type of person that wants to just go to the back of the book and get the answer right away, this is your take home message. If your soil is really dark, it's probably good. Uh, good soils are alive. They've got life in them. You've got bacteria and insects and fungi all working together as a community. If you want to improve your soil, the number one thing to do is to add organic matter. Put some leaf humus in there, put some compost in there, add some natural wood chips. All of these things are gonna feed your soil, feed that life that's in your soil. So if you take nothing else home about your soil, this is what I want you to take home. It's just add more organic matter. And you're gonna learn more about compost from Rust Belt writers, I think. But what the heck is soil? What makes it different than dirt? Soil occurs over time. Uh, it occurs naturally. It's made up of minerals and organic matter and the upper layer of Earth's crust, basically. It supports all these systems above the ground. It's a, it's a community. All of these things are determined by the soil. If we have sandy soils, it affects what can live in them versus clay soils. Plants have certain preferences for what kind of soil they like. So we need to learn what our soil needs for what we want to plant there and give it to it. Basically, soils are rocks that get weathered over time and organic matter gets applied to them. And when I say time, it's a lot of time. It takes over 100 years to make one inch of topsoil. And if any of you are gardeners, you know that one inch of topsoil is not a lot of, of topsoil to support our gardens. So we really don't want to screw up what we have. And um, we really want to feed what we, what we don't. Soil is made in layers. Uh, <laughs> Justin, I think, who's since left us, made this slide with the tiramisu to <laughs> show the layers. But basically, starting at the bottom is bedrock. That's that, that native geology that's here. That's what we start from. And in Ohio, we have several different geologies. So depending on where you live will depend on what soils you get. And then above that, we get stuff starts to break down, starts to create the apparent material of the soil. Then we get into the layer where you start to get different chemicals and metals that create the subsoil. And then you got a little layer in between there where things move in between. And then you start to get the, what we, we wanna know about is the good topsoil where we've got the living organic creatures We've got that humus that's coming into there and the, the um, minerals that have been weathered. And then on top, we'll have a really thin organic layer. And that's those leaves that are falling each year, our dead plants that are, that are decaying each year and feeding that. When we talk about minerals, uh, I'm trying not to be too soil science-y for you guys, but I think of it in the spectrum from sand to clay. And sand is when I go down to the beach and it's real gritty. So that's that larger particle that I can feel in my fingers. Whereas clay is like pottery. Um, so you can make a ribbon with it when it's wet, it sticks together. And then silt is just somewhere in between. It's gritty, but not quite as gritty as sand and it's not quite as small as clay. And this is what it would look like if we let it all settle out in a water column. That sand, the heavier, Bigger, bigger particles would fall to the bottom, silt would be in between and clay would be above. But we never usually have just pure clay or pure sand, we usually get a mix. And this is how a soil scientist would tell you what you have. If you had 70% um, silt and 40% sand and somewhere around 50% clay, you would have a silty loam. Um, but all you really need to know is mostly clay, mostly sand uh, and then We'll talk about your soil test. Soils are made up of 45% minerals, 25% air, so the spaces in between, and 25% water. And then organic matter only makes up 5% of soil composition, but it's 
the most important part. So even though it's the only 5%, it's doing all of the work. And so this is the compost and the humus and the decaying plants. This is our mycorrhizae, all those fungi talking to each other in your soil, creating healthy spaces, um, macroorganisms. So actually most earthworms are not native to here. So <laughs> seeing them is like, a, I don't know, they're not always a great sign, but having a healthy insects in there and then bacteria, those microorganisms that are talking with your plants roots as well as the soil. All this stuff is the stuff that really makes a major difference. And this, these organic matter is what's gonna create, help create this desirable soil. We want our soil to act like a sponge. We want it to be able to absorb and expand, contract and filter and just keep that cycle going every time it rains, basically. So even though, like I said, the organic matter makes up 5%, that's what drives what making a healthy soil. If you don't have healthy biology, your soil can get too compacted which prevents water from traveling through it. You can get your chemistry messed up. So basically you could have nutrients in your soil, but if you didn't have the right bacteria to make it available to your plants, then it's not doing anything. So it's really important that this is all balanced correctly. But Elizabeth, I'm not a soil scientist. How the heck am I supposed to figure all this out? <laughs> you take a test, a soil test. So Amy in our office is going to send you guys soil tests and they will test for you. We're gonna send you the Penn State one, Amy said. And basically you're gonna take your shovel or your little soil tool like this one on the right. You're gonna go out to your garden and you're gonna take basically a cup full of that soil, dry it out real good, sift it, get out the roots and the rocks, and then you put it in your soil kit packet and send it off to Penn State and they're gonna run it through their lab and test things for you. Soil tests can do everything from nutrients to uh, things like lead, which is really important to test for in Cleveland, especially, uh, as well as that uh, the biology or the organic matter. So the Penn State test is gonna test for pH, phosphate, potassium, magnesium, calcium, as well as organic matter. So you're gonna get all of those for free. If you want other things from the test, you can ask them for them. You just have to send them a check for those pieces of the test, basically. And Amy has been through this a million times. So if you have questions, you can just reach out to her. And I gave Connie, um, Amy, as well as Jacob's contact information. And this is what it's gonna look like. And you're gonna say, what the heck does this mean? And then you'll call Jacob <laughs> and he'll let you know. <laughs> but basically, the nutrients that you want to know about are nitrogen. Nitrogen is what's going to make your plants green on the top. Phosphorus, which is going to support your root, root growth. And like I said, we want to make sure it's the right amount. We don't want to over apply phosphorus because if we put in too much, it just heads off to Lake Erie and we don't want that. We want to keep, keep that uh, phosphorus in balance for our plants. And potassium is going to help build your plant's durability and protect it from disease. And then they're gonna test for the biology. So they're gonna let you know what's living in your soil. And you really want a community. And that's how you know that it's healthy. You wanna have all these good, good insects and bacteria working together. We wanna think about soil as something that we need to manage, just like how, we're, how we wanna watch for disease in our plant, we wanna watch for disease in our soils because all of these things are gonna help, help us grow. Organic matter or OM is vital. If you, don't, if you don't do anything else, just add organic matter. It'll make your soils much more happy. Soil organism, organisms need all the stuff that we need. They need food, they need air, they need water. And organic matter is what, what feeds the life that's living in your soil. Organic matter can come from things like um, decaying roots, that you can add compost, and it helps to basically create the structure in that soil to make sure that your soil is gonna absorb nutrients and release it to your plants appropriately, create that space for infiltration of water. And we wanna make sure that what we're not doing is some of the conventional practices that, that require, then require more help. When you till every year, now you're destroying all of that system that has been built in your soil and now you have to do things to supplement that. So we wanna to try to avoid that if we can. Unfortunately, we live in Cleveland. <laughs> Cleveland soils, generally speaking, 
especially in the inner city, are biologically dead. So we need to bring back the life to the soils. They're highly compacted, which means water can't really infiltrate in there. And it's hard for the roots to even make a dent. You need really aggressive plants to break up the soil. Uh, the pH is off. And those nutrients, they aren't in a mobile, mobile way. They can't get to the plants easily. And it's full of random stuff. Uh, when I built my rain garden, I pulled up, I don't even know how much shale and I'm out in the burbs. So, you know, you never know what you're gonna find when you start digging a garden in Cleveland. So you get your soil test back and you find out, oh crap, I got Cleveland soils, what am I gonna do? A lot of folks then go to chemical fertilizers, which we wanna advise you not to do. When you start to put chemicals into our soil and onto our plants, they may work temporarily to make our plants happy, but they're over time, they're breaking down your soils, they're destroying the ecology. A lot of these chemicals aren't good for us or for pets. And all of this stuff ends up running out to Lake Erie where we get our drinking water. It creates a system that requires constant input. So you add the fertilizer and then your soil won't, your plants won't be happy without, without it, adding more and more and more. Um, it also creates more susceptibility to pests. Uh, the fertilizers aren't just feeding your plants, they're feeding the weeds. So now you need to do things to get rid of the weeds um, and more watering, basically just a less robust system. And it's ironic, but yeah, you know, we're trying to create nature <laughs> and uh, relying on chemicals and fertilizers just, you know, seems counterintuitive to creating a luscious green space. And doing that comes with economic and environmental costs. We want to encourage you to really break the cycle of relying on chemicals because there's ways to have a healthy garden and soil without adding these toxic treatments. And they're natural amendments. <laughs> and so we like to add a little jokes in here, um, compost jokes. If your soil looks like the one on the left, you're good, man. Your soil's great. You can just say, oh, yeah, yeah, Elizabeth, I got it. Um, but if it's not good, maybe consider compost and natural amendments. Rust Belt Riders is a local partner that takes our food waste and turns that into soil that you can buy from them. And I believe they're gonna talk with you guys more about composting and how you can reuse that food space to feed, food waste to feed your, feed your gardens, which is really cool. I'm a lazy composter, but I do compost and I use, I've used it to create rain gardens and in my garden spaces and it's wonderful, it's free. And, you know, why not, man? There's lots of other natural amendments that you can use depending on what your soil test says. If your mineral contents are off or your chemistry are off, the most common is to use lime and sulfur. Organic matter, you can add compost, you can use leaf humus. Out here in Westlake, we're very fortunate the city actually collects all those leaves and then turns it into humus for pretty cheap that homeowners can use. A lot of places have wood chips. Uh, the Metro Park sometimes have those out and you can just steal those. Uh, coffee grounds and then fertilizers. There are natural fertilizers that you can use depending on what you find out that your chemistry is and what nutrients you need. I am not an expert on these amendments, but if you wanna know more about them, um, Jacob in our office can certainly help break these down for you. If you do find out that you need sulfur or limestone, there are calculators for that. And uh, these links are here and don't feel like you have to write this down, we'll send you the slides. But we wanna make sure that you're adding the right amount of things. You don't want to over apply a good thing just because it's a good thing. Uh, making sure that we only apply what we need because we don't wanna waste it. I've thrown a lot of information at you, I know. So we have more webinars available on demand from Green Yard, from Green Yards and Healthy Homes to our Let the Flare See the Air program. If you wanna learn all about improper mulching and tree care. Amy does a great job with that program. We have a master rain gardener workshop, which is an intense five, five class workshop where you learn how to build your own rain garden. Uh, rain Barrel 101, lots of opportunities on our website if you're interested in more of these topics. We know we can't gather in larger groups right now, but we can all do small individual things that really add up to improve our water quality and soil quality. So I'd really encourage you to check out our website to learn more about our, our campaigns and join one of them. If you do enough different uh, actions, you can become a watershed champion and we can get you a sign for your yard. Uh, like I said, you can do that, take, use the right salt pledge and get yourself a salt mug. We're doing all kinds of fun cleanups and storm drain sense lane, basically outdoor stuff or, or online programming that we can all do in a safe distance way. 
I really want to encourage you to think about how we use the land and how it impacts our water and soil resources and don't hesitate to reach out if you want to learn more about actions you can take to be more sustainable with your gardens or in your business or in your home. Uh, we were sharing a ton of resources with Connie and those are all available on our website. So I just want to thank you guys so much for letting me join you. I was really excited when Connie reached out and I was like, man, this sounds so exciting. I'm, I can't wait to see all your beautiful gardens. I'm happy to take questions and I, I think I'm going to sit on and listen in uh, so I can find out about all the good work you guys are going to do. Yay, thank you so much, Elizabeth. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, every slide, it was like screenshot, screenshot, even though you're going to send them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, um, are there any questions? Anybody have any questions or comments? Leaving some space for that. Yeah, I actually do. If I can um, just jump in and start off. And anyone else should just unmute their mic. Or if you want to put it in the chat, that's fine too. Um, so I have a couple of things. And um, so one is about the depth of the soil. So uh, we are... Um, encouraging in the beds that we sort of renovate um, the participants to make raised beds. So we have a good example of this on our street of some gorilla gardening where somebody already mm -hmm. did this. Um, it took quite a bit of soil to fill that bed then. And, um, you know, and that gets costly. And then if you're going to put like organic matter on top of that, that's sort of another thing to think about. And so I'm just wondering, um, it was interesting to me to see that slide that had the stacked, um, you know, layers. And uh, I wonder how much is sort of necessary in terms of the richer nutrients. And then um, like, is it, I mean, I guess, of course, it probably depends a little bit on the plants that you're using. But um, in terms of, uh, you know, some of it might just be, okay, well, how much do you want to fill that so it doesn't look empty? <laughs> but are there different like layers that could be put in so that maybe there's like a less nutritious layer and then more and then, uh, you know, they're really golden nutrition. Yeah. And I'm going to say that I don't know the 100% honest answer to this, but I have opinions that are at least relatively educated. <laughs> so I would say, you know, based on master rain gardeners, when we tell people to build those rain gardens, we're asking them to dig their garden to a depth six inches deeper than what it'll actually be. And so I would say at least six inches to support of the good stuff to support your roots um, would be a good start. Okay. And then I think probably ideally it's a little more. Um, and so I will ask Jacob for the gardening answer <laughs> to this, especially for those of you that might be doing edible food. And I apologize, I did not find anything, and I'm sure there is something about edibles that can deal with the salt input. So it's, I'm still keeping an eye out for that. And I find, if I find it, I'll pass it along. So I would say six inches is a good start if you know, you're on a tight budget. They've done real studies with trees, especially and the amount of soil does make a difference, especially in our urban landscapes. The more soil space a plant can have, the happier it's going to be. Um, that said, if you choose a lot of short rooted plants, you could probably, like if you chose a ground cover or something, you could probably get away with less is my guess. So I will look for the official answer, um, but I would say start with, you know, at least six, six to 12 inches would probably be a good start of the good stuff, but yeah. certainly it's okay to have less good stuff at the bottom because over time that organic matter will filter down in and it'll improve what's at the bottom. Okay. And there really isn't any other, is there anything else that you could use besides salt to deal with the ice? Yes, you can use sand um, and you can use, there's other products. Mm. Now they, I feel like they've made something out of beet juice and it depends on the temperature um, but I would I think you'll be solving that solution if you create the raised beds right. I, a little bit because you'll prevent that salt from just migrating into your gardens right. and I like I, I'm torn at the stormwater side of me is like oh keep them low so the water can get in 
and then you don't have to water them. But the pragmatic side of me is like, they're already kind of raised anyway. So I don't feel like water other than what falls from the sky is really um, making it in any ways. So I'm torn with that. But I do think from a protecting your plants and for giving them a healthier start, having more soil is going to be better and trying to keep the salt out is certainly better. Right. Okay. I'm going to let somebody else ask, ask a question if they have it, but then um, I have more. <laughs> yeah, Linda, I have, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, hi. Um, so the good thing about this project is that there are going to be six rain barrels catching the rain, the stormwater and feeding these nice. boxes. So that's a win-win for, for the water conservation. So yay. 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 Yeah. Yeah, so uh, people will have those rain barrels available to get water um, to rain to water the beds, and we have actually people, um, uh, wagons and uh, watering cans and stuff for people to be able to transport that easily from wherever we hook those up. That's perfect. I would caveat, and I meant to mention it, with rain barrel water. It's great for our native plants, and for you can just use it. Don't worry about it. If you decide that your garden is going to have edibles in it, you just want to make sure to test the water for irrigation quality. It doesn't have to be drinking water quality, but you want to make sure there's not certain metals in it that would get, and only certain plants it matters, like leafy stuff is more important that you don't water it with bad water because then you eat it. Um, so if you do, if someone decides to go down that avenue, just reach out and I can connect you with some more information about it. It really depends on what your roof surface is kind of. Right, um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, Caitlin had a question about the depth of the beds that we have currently without raising them. And uh, so we actually don't know for sure. We are gonna go out and do uh, and dig so that we do know. Um, I from talking to Michael Loderstedt, who already created his own raised bed, he said that the, what was there was pretty bad and was um, actually maybe partly just some of the construction debris that had been on the street and they like threw it in the bed and then put yeah. some other soil on it. So uh, he was pulling out bricks and all kinds of stuff. Um, I can't say I'm surprised. <laughs> um, if you need tools to help with that, let us know. We have some soil probes that you guys could borrow to maybe make the digging part a little easier and poke around in there. Okay, that sounds good. We probably will. <laughs> we can just put that on the list. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's working in urban environments is all. You never know what you're gonna really come across. So yeah. So. Okay, I'm going to be quiet if someone else has a question. Uh, we have a question, do tar paper roofs adversely affect leafy greens? Tar paper roofs. I would have to look that one up. Mm. I need to start remembering this roof stuff because it gets asked almost every time, <laughs> but it's always a different kind of roof. Um, and I, I always forget where I found, I have a resource for it and I always forget and I have to dig through my email and find it. Um, but I will look that up and probably Connie, I'll do a follow-up email for any of these questions that I, that I don't know the answer to. Okay. Like in our uh, green roof, uh, we, in our project, we're having something like a cistern underneath the ground. And in doing that, uh, we will have to put in um, like a first wash system. So it will come, um, the water will come down the gutter, but then there will be sort of like a system to catch, which I think is more for larger debris. Um, and then I'm not sure if we will end up adding any kind of a filter after that. Um, there are lots of things that can be added. Um, I think it's like stuff that's pretty standard now in terms of uh, filtering and pumps uh, for water, rainwater that's come off of your roof. Yeah, they've got, and, and you guys aren't the first to do repurposing, I think. I think Mitchell's downtown yeah, maybe created. Yeah, so definitely reach out to those partners. And you're with the with Reed helping you guys out. She'll have all the resources. 
that you need. And but there, all of that stuff does require maintenance. And so, feel free to reach out about that too. You know, we do maintenance training on that kind of stuff for municipalities. So you, when you're talking about your filter catcher, you got to check that sometimes <laughs> and make sure that you remove the debris. Um, there's, you know, little maintenance points. This is so exciting though that you guys are taking on a larger issue and doing it in a way that's creating a beautiful space. I, I think it's amazing. Yeah, it's exciting to work on. Um, and then you were talking about the weeds and I just have to admit that like, the weed battle is so hard <laughs> and like, and it's so easy to feel like, oh my God, I just want to pour a round up on all of it. Like, it's just so hard. So uh, my technique is over planting to plant more stuff. So there's just no space for the weeds. <laughs> like, don't let them come in, just plant, fill it up. Um, some people don't like that aesthetic, obviously. So it kind of depends, but mulch, mulch really does work pretty well. And if you, we have some, if you, if you really want to learn a little more about weeds, our green yards, healthy homes, I think I included the link for that document, Connie, in my materials. And that has some read your weed tips. If you time your weeding right and you do it at the right time, you know, and knowing if your weed's an annual or if it's a perennial, it can be manageable. But a little bit of knowledge goes a long way because I'm the same way. I hate, hate, I don't mind weeding other people's gardens, but I don't like weeding my own. Um, <laughs> and I learned some really good things about if you time it right and you get those annuals at the right time. It, the rest of the year, it's really not that bad. And then it's just like, you know, bi-weekly touch-ups. I think also getting rid of your grass is probably a good way to go. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to go too far down my, my soapbox, <laughs> but yeah. And it's, and it's being okay with some things that we consider weeds because sometimes weeds are native plants that just aren't turf and so we we decide they're bad you know there's native violets and those are wonderful and they support our pollinators but if you all you want is grass then you know it's a weed that leads into my next question which is this native plants and the difference between weeds and native plants and i know obviously like those are just terms and so of course there's lots of crossover there but just thinking about uh, you know, there's obviously a large trend to restore native plants, and um, I am I am really truly unclear. Like when we were doing a large weeding with volunteers of the beds that are there now, and some of those were also the uh, included the uh, rain gardens of the parking lots that we have on Waterloo. At some point, I just thought, what am I doing? Like, I think I'm probably just tearing out a bunch of native plants. Like, this is probably actually good for pollinators, even though it's looking kind of messy. And so I wasn't sure if really we should have just put a big sign up that said, like, these are native plants, be okay with it. You yeah. know? Or put a border around it. If you put a border around it, it becomes a tidy space. Um, <laughs> And it re the truth really is a weed is just a plant that you don't want somewhere. And so if you don't want that native plant in your garden in front of city hall, but you don't mind it in your backyard, then you know it's a weed there, but not there. Uh, what we really want to avoid is invasive plants. And so those are plants that are not from here and they're so aggressive that they literally outcompete all of our natives. So invasive is the one you really don't want at all. If you've got a plant that your mayor just doesn't like, well, that sucks for pollinators, but you know, sometimes yeah. public spaces need to look good. <laughs> and so it's a balance. That said, there are native plants that are more accepted. You know, purple cone flower is the one that like everyone, everyone loves purple cone flowers and they just happen to be like the first native that made it big. <laughs> like you can find it anywhere, you know, buy it at your big box store. Um, so there are, there are plants that are more accepted than others. Um, you know, everyone likes brown-eyed Susans and, and, but signage is important though. If you have a sign, especially for the times when it's not in bloom, because if you've got a garden that looks beautiful from May through October, but you wanna leave the standing dead over the winter, 
having that knowledge that people saw it and they saw that sign and they were like, okay, I know this is going to be a beautiful space again in May. Like that, you know, is a trigger for people to say, oh, it's okay that it looks a little untidy right now. Um, yeah. And that's all social stuff, which is hard. Because <laughs> like, mm. everyone, everyone has different aesthetics, you know? Yeah. Well, um, thank you so much for the question and answers. I do want to be mindful of time. Yeah. Yeah. So um, unless there are any like very pressing issues. Oh, yeah. I can oh, monitor the chat. Terry. Like oh yeah okay great yeah then keep chatting any questions for elizabeth and um we'll just pivot over and do a, a short little section um about the uh green palette team structure so this is something that amy and i have been just like noodling over for a long time so i have my screen split right now um on the left it might be kind of hard to read but this is just the green palette press release that you can find online on the waterloo arts website it's um, there's also a freshwater Cleveland article about it, and it's just kind of a refresher of like what how we're describing the program. But um, probably more pertinent to our conversation right now is this image on the right. It's a diagram, and it kind of illustrates the way that we're organizing the work structure for this for this project. And um, Amy and I would love to get your like gut initial reactions to this. Um, maybe you don't have any, um, maybe it's too soon to tell, but this is kind of what we're thinking of. Um, it, it makes sense to us and we have been um, working on it for a while. So basically um, full disclosure, I am the program manager, but I am actually transitioning out of this role. I moved cross country, so I'm actually calling in from Seattle. So I miss Cleveland a lot, but we are like working on making a very smooth transition to the person that is going to be managing this program. And so whoever that person ends up being is this like purple shape in the middle, the program manager at Waterloo Arts, who is going to be working in lockstep with Amy. Um, and then that person, uh, one of their first tasks is going to be to find five team leads. And these team leads could be some of you in this Zoom room, or they could be other people in the community. Um, regardless of who they are, there will be five of them. And each of them, so they're the blue circles, each of them is going to be responsible for up to four planter beds. So uh, the team lead need not take on four beds, but they can. Um, and they can bring on team members to help them do that. And we're not really putting a set number on who on, uh, on team members for those team leads so it could be like you know you have eight people and so it's two people working on each of the four beds or something and um so when I, we're talking oh yeah go ahead amy i wanted to jump in for a second and just say that we are hoping that the team leads do uh do four beds like that is the goal and just we're limited um, by a budget for these beds. So, um, and, and each of those beds, it could be one person if they were totally inspired and really wanted to have control of that bed, or it could be a team of people that works on it. And then that is kind of a little cohort pod um, and just seemed like that was a easier way to sort of manage the, uh, project since there were like 72 beds and <laughs> it could get really crazy. Totally. Um, yeah. And then the frame. So um, we are working with the Cuyahoga Master Gardeners. They are a volunteer based group and they're affiliated with Ohio State University. They um, they have a group of community garden mentors and five of those people are uh, going to participate in the project acting as consultants so throughout the gardening season they will have available like dedicated hours to meet with teams and team leads to provide uh, insight and expertise on the design of the beds as well as like gardening tips and then i have another frame around that which is the community at large just kind of um, reminding us that this is all happening in the context of the neighborhood of um, Collingwood and of Cleveland. And so there will surely be opportunities to get feedback from community members that are walking by and to um, just like have these beds be the site of uh, dialogue and conversation. So all of these people working in this way will be sharing a pool of resources. So that includes a budget for each 
team lead to kind of be responsible for divvying out um, as well as um, shared tools. So we've already gotten some like shovels and trowels and gloves and things um, and carts that will be communal use tools. Yeah. So, and I guess I just want to also jump in because I think it's a little um, hard maybe even to get a picture of like, what is the green palette? Um, and so, and, and how is that an art project? And we really think of it, I mean, I am certainly thinking of it as a uh, probably temporary, but could go on um, project, uh, public art project in the sense that um, it is a community engagement project where we want the community to, number one, um, uh, be in dialogue about public space and about these public spaces and that that's an ongoing conversation throughout this, um, this project, this summer, this spring, um, but that also those spaces are really a design um, challenge. So like they're, they're a way to express something about yourself, to tell a story. They're a way to talk about something that you think is important in um, a neighborhood, in um, just in a space. Uh, and I think there's lots of ways to do that through um, growing and through these beds. And so uh, we just feel that like it's just like we had, some of you may have been familiar with this design lab that we had with these parking spaces where we kind of gave over a parking space as a way of saying like, if it weren't a parking space, then, you know, what could you dream of in this space? And what uh, do you think maybe your community needs more of or would be a healthy part of a, a community social ecosystem? Um, and so, these, I think, spaces can be similar to that. Um, and they're also a way for, I think, the community to come together and participate in a project that hopefully we're all past this and we're just hugging and dancing on floors together like this summer, um, getting all sweaty together, but who knows? So uh, this was a way that throughout the spring that we could really um, spend some time and feel like we were part of a community and um, a communal project uh, together in our neighborhood, but that would allow us also a little space from each other and to be outside and do it outside. Um, and I, we have a couple of times in particular, obviously, um, there will be you know, people walking on Waterloo and being able to see these, we are hoping to have some uh, online presence for the beds and be able to talk about what is in them and who's working on them and, um, and some of the resources uh, that we will be sharing and that hopefully you all will share with us uh, throughout this project. Um, but then at the Waterloo Arts Fest, uh, However, that looks this summer. It may not be one day, it may be spread over uh, weekends, but we are hoping to highlight the beds then, to tell some of the stories at that point, and then also uh, the Cleveland Garden Walk. Um, so sort of another time to be able to showcase and do the tell the story of the beds. Um, so this is a project that is, uh, it is developing with you <laughs> as we do it. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and is really, is not supposed to be burdensome or foisted on anyone, you know, it is, you participate as much as you like. I think once you make a commitment to a bed, then we hope that you are energized and really will follow through because gardening is not easy. And there's so many times that, uh, you know, it's lots of ups and downs and we want to all go through that together. Um, but we do hope that people will have a commitment um, to following through with that. But, you know, if you wanted to come to all the webinars and just take this knowledge and use it in your own um, bed, in your own yard, then that's totally fine too. Uh, you know, 
we all got busy lives and so we totally understand um, but we want to hear from you all we want to hear ideas and feedback and to all be part of this uh process so um i don't know connie i'm sorry like i just sort of jumped in like blabbing but do you have any more that oh, that's fine uh, no, nothing more um, right now, but just wanted to, again, give space to people who might have feedback or thoughts. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, going back to um, Amy's thought about soil earlier, I tried something. I made a garden in what was a lot before, so the soil was just terrible. And I used a method where I I dug out like a foot and a half, and then I lined the bottom with logs and just sticks from around. And that over time, it'll take up space to begin with, but it will also um, decompose and feed the garden. Mm. That's interesting. I wonder so if you cool. have to be careful about what uh, the wood is that you use in that situation. Or, you know, like I wonder if it matters in terms of then the balance of uh, like the pH balance of the um, soil or maybe. I think at the bottom of the garden, it won't be a problem. You just don't want to use any invasive stuff, like especially in Japanese knotweed or some, something that would root and then like take over. Um, so make sure it's dead. Uh, <laughs> on top of the garden, wood chips can, um, they can actually steal nutrients for a while. Uh, so you just want to be aware of that. It usually works out, but um, no, that's a, yeah, hugel culture or permaculture. It's a, it's a whole thing. I'm le like learning about it. That's really cool, Kristen, that you, you tried that in an urban landscape. I think that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, we actually have, um, and I don't know, uh, Elizabeth, this is a question for you or not, but we we do have trees in all of our beds. So that's a little bit of a challenge. And um, I know you have to be careful about how you, what like what you put on top of the roots of trees. And yeah, I didn't go too deep into it because I didn't know that you had trees, but we have a whole um, a whole workshop and Western Reserve Land Conservancy actually has a tree steward training that whoever's going to be caring for your trees, I would highly recommend that program. It's, I think they're, you know, obviously like all of us making it remote this year, um, but it was kind of a two classes inside before and two out, like one focused on pruning and one focused on tree care. And, but make sure whatever you do, mulch does not touch the trunk and trees are not planted too deep. So when you see a tree in the forest, it has a, a flare at the bottom. We want to keep the flare. Don't bury your flare, basically. Um, so if, if you want to learn more about that, Amy's uh, Let the Flare See the Air uh, video is good for that. And there's actually a huge tree workshop coming up. So I'll make sure to share that link with Connie so she can share that as well. I just saw that get posted. There's so many people doing all this stuff. It's like constant saturation. And I forget that most people have no idea. <laughs> not everyone is getting all of these workshops like I am. Um, but yeah, tree care is a whole thing. And that tree steward training is really good um, to get you the basics so you know enough for when you need an expert versus when you can do stuff yourself. Um, that's good to know. And I would be happy, you know, to come back and do, you know, some basic tree or we could have Colleen in our office as a, as a pretty tree savvy person that could help with some training. If you have folks that specifically are like, help, uh, teach us. <laughs> okay, well, that sounds good. I think we will reach out for that. Um, let's see, are there any other questions in the chat? Yeah, and at this point, is anybody like really eager about being a team, like if anybody's like super eager about being a team lead or super eager about like any particular component, um, feel free to just reach out and we can make sure um, yeah, we're gonna, that you know. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna, everybody I think is probably signed up on our email list. So we'll send out information that way. Um, yeah. Stays up to date and opportunities and 
And Connie, can you just tell us real quick what the next webinar is? Yes, so the next webinar is, it's on February 25th, same time, uh, 6 p.m. Uh, so it's a Thursday, it's also going to be virtual on Zoom. And it will be a presentation by Mark White from Grid All Green Partnership, which is like an awesome, awesome organization. If you don't know about them, look at their website, it's amazing. And um, Mark will be speaking about the social impacts of urban agriculture. So I think that actually that is a great uh, next webinar in this sequence. Um, and I think that Mark might also be bringing in some youth core. So Red All Green Partnership has a lot of youth training programs and apprenticeship programs for urban farming. And um, I think he mentioned that he's going to try and get some students involved um, in that webinar. So I think it will be awesome. And um, then in March, we, same thing, last Thursday, 6 p.m., we'll have Joanne Barch from the Cuyahoga Master Gardeners, who will be doing a deep dive into native North American perennials. So, great. Yeah, yeah, so great lineup. And then, I mean, I could go on. Um, we have April and May, and every month, I think, is going to be great. So just, um, yeah, we'll keep spamming your email with, um, with the schedule so you don't forget. Cool. All right, well, I think we will wrap up for tonight, but thanks um, to everybody for tuning in and um, yeah, we will see you. We'll see you soon. Yeah, thank you so much, Elizabeth. This is yes, really, really thank wonderful. You, thank you. All right, bye, good night. Good night.